go ahead and get started and hopefully uh, people will trickle back from the break. Uh, one thing I've learned from doing innumerable conferences over the year is there's no such thing as a 15 minute break or a 10 minute break or a 20 minute break. Whatever it is, you got to add five minutes to it. So I of all people should know that. Um, but uh, let's get started and uh, move along and uh, our colleagues will join us. Um, okay, I'm not going to whistle like that because it will probably cause feedback in the microphone. Uh, but good morning, I'm Craig Schneider. I am a senior health researcher at Mathematica Policy Research and uh, my main role there is running the national learning collaborative for Medicare Accountable Care Organizations. And uh, we heard Medicare ACOs uh, discussed in the last panel. So happy to chat with you about that during the breaks or lunch. But that's actually not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm actually here in my role on the New England HIMSS board as both a member of the programs committee and as the health information exchange liaison. So we said, well, let's put together a panel related to that theme, uh, but let's dress it up in the, the very sexy attire of big data. So that's what we're going to talk about in this session, is big data interoperability. And we pulled together uh, three of the leading uh, health information exchanges and data organizations in New England to talk about this subject. Oh, so, oh, it worked. Yeah. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce the panelists today, an esteemed group. We have Laura Adams, who is the president and CEO of the Rhode Island Quality Institute, and Jeff, Jeffrey Laughlin, the executive director of the New Hampshire Health Information Organization, and Marilyn Schlein Kramer, who is the deputy executive director of the Massachusetts Center for Health Information and Analysis. And uh, you already met me. Uh, but I'll start off, and of course, they will tell you a lot about their organizations in just a few moments, so we'll circle back to that. Uh, but I want to do a little bit of level setting about the topic for this session. So, uh, does anyone recognize this photo? Uh, it's from the movie Bruce Almighty, which I would recommend. It's, it's fun and entertaining. Um, so, big data. Uh, big data is not a large data set. Uh, in fact, when I started with Mathematica about three years ago, uh, I actually gave a talk on this topic. And people said, oh, we do big data. We've got the Medicare claims data set. What could be bigger than that? Um, but so think of something like the Medicare claims data set as a huge filing cabinet. But that's not what big data is. This is big data, right? People remember this uh, classic I Love Lucy episode. The data isn't just sitting in a file cabinet, no matter how big. It's moving on a conveyor belt at almost warp speed and actually coming in multiple directions. And you can't eat the chocolate fast enough. That's what big data is. So when we think about uh, big data and healthcare, and people might be aware, healthcare is, you know, we heard about the banking example and the car reservation example in the last panel. Healthcare, there's another place where we're pretty much lagging behind other industries. Um, so if you think about where data came from in conventional healthcare data sources, right? chart abstractions. Anyone done chart abstractions? That is not a fast conveyor belt, right? Um, discharge data from hospitals, claims data, including uh, the more uh, new all-payer claims database source, and electronic medical record data. But the stuff that's coming out, and of course that those things are all part of, quote, big data, but we've also got new sources coming out enormous amounts of data coming out of genomics and proteomics. Proteomics is the study of protein composition. And of course, as we just heard, patient-generated data 
and how do the physicians aggregate that in a useful way? And social media. Uh, a few, you know, later on today we're going to have a, our own pitchathon. A few years ago, I organized a Data Palooza, and one of the companies there talked about how they developed an app that can track flu just by what people are tweeting, and you could find concentrations of illness based on the tweets that were being sent. So that's another uh, source of data that's going on. So conventionally, we were collecting transactional data, right? Stuff that's coming out of claims or billing. Um, and then they were stored in the inpatient discharge database. More recently, last 10, 12 years, in all payer claims databases. And that's still only a, a minority of states that have those. And then there's multiple statewide and federal databases. In fact, if you go to healthdata.gov, they have 664 data sets. So there's plenty. So even if you think of the conventional data, uh, the extent and scope of it's enormous. But now, of course, we're getting stuff from social media and the internet and machine readable data and stuff coming out of biometrics and stuff that humans are generating on their own. So how do we even uh, contemplate dealing with this? So uh, here's my high-tech map of New England uh, that shows you our, uh, our panelists' representatives and uh, the communities that they uh, help organize and submit data and share data with. And so I'm going to ask each of them to talk about what their organization does, what its role is in their state health system, how they're using this data and thinking about the future, and what are some of those challenges to interoperability? Because having it in the file cabinet isn't going to get it done. We have to figure a way for it to get somehow in the public use. And then now that we've got patient-generated data and other forms of big data, what are the implications for organizations that were pretty much built on the historical conventional data model? And you know, there are federal laws, we heard about Stark and HIPAA in the previous panel, but there are also state-specific laws, and some of those might facilitate interoperability and health information exchange, and others might hamper uh, HIE and interoperability. So we'll also find out about what those state-specific environments are. Uh, so I'd like to welcome up Marilyn to uh, begin our discussion. Do you want to change the order? We can mix it up. I can just hit forward. All right. Well, welcome. You're first. Okay. Hi, everybody. Oh, you can do better than that. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so I thought I had home field advantage, pun intended, because I was from Massachusetts, and my fellow speakers are from out of state. But I guess we're not going to do home field advantage. So as Craig mentioned, I am uh, Deputy Executive Director of the Center for Health Information Analysis. Show of hands, how many people know about Shia? Ooh, wow. Obviously, we're not uh, marketing ourselves as well as we should. So uh, Chia is an independent state agency established by the legislature as part of its 2012 health care reform bill, Chapter 224. And we serve as the Commonwealth's primary hub for health care data and a primary source of healthcare analytics that support policy development by such agencies as the Health Policy Commission. Uh, our executive director is appointed by uh, three, uh, the three constitutional officers, the attorney general, the state auditor, and the governor's office. However, we have an oversight council, and that includes Laura Adams, a fellow speaker, who, although she works in Rhode Island, lives in Massachusetts, and thereby qualifies to be on our oversight council. Uh, we publish official, official statistics, something called total medical expense, which is the total cost of care, uh, referred to as TME in the industry. And we also conduct continuing studies of the financial health of Massachusetts hospitals, and um, uh, the rate of insurance and uh, issues about the underinsured. But they're here, what I'm, talk, what I'm here to talk about, though, is our data assets. Oops. 
We have several data assets. Uh, we classify them by type of data. Um, we have financial reports that hospitals are required to submit, with, submit to us on their financial condition. We also have information about health insurance, uh, insurers and contracting, and then we also conduct survey data to look at uh, insurance rates. I'm going to focus in on the first, which is patient level data, because that will be of most interest to the, this audience. We have two types of patient data. The first, uh, although it's listed here as second, is the, the so-called case mix files. That is uh, patient level abstracts of every patient discharged from Massachusetts acute care hospitals. So that is a census of data of every, uh, every, every patient discharge. Um, the second data set, which I'll spend more time on, is the Massachusetts All Payer Claims data set, the so-called APCD. The APCD are um, adjudicated claims from commercial and public payers. It uh, Medicare data is available to state agencies only. We have the CMS files for Massachusetts residents. But, a but for people from the hospitals, we get the adjudicated 837s that you send into the carriers. They come to us along with information about patient eligibility, product type, provider directories and contracts, um, and pharmacy claims, and dental claims as well. So we get all of the claims. We have uh, about 95% of all of Massachusetts residents under age 65 in the database. And it's available over a five year period, five year rolling period. So it becomes a huge asset to understand patient migration, patient practice patterns, total cost of care, because we see the entire patient as it's seen through health insurance data, medical claims data. There are some exceptions, and I've noted them here, but generally we have the vast majority of Massachusetts residents. APCDs are a growing national trend. Um, and you, actually, New England is called the pioneer, uh, or include the pioneers of the APCDs. In addition to ours, there's an APCD in New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. Rhode Island has an APCD, but it's slightly newer, but we were considered the New England pioneers for many, for many years. Um, we, as you can see, Massachusetts is among the few states that has a multi, a very um, a relatively diverse patient population type in terms of race and ethnicity of all the APCDs uh, indicated by the dark blue here. And we also have a huge rate of insurance for many years thanks to Romney Care. So as a result, our data is used by researchers throughout the country because it becomes such a good lab by having this data set. Well, I've been working on it for four years, but I think Massachusetts should justifiably be proud of this data resource. What makes the Massachusetts um, APCD unique is something called administrative simplification. Now, I've been a state employee for four years. The concept of administrative simplification when I joined the state was an oxymoron like military intelligence. But I'm here to say that we have made great roads. Previously, the Division of Insurance, the Group Insurance Commission, which provides insurance to all the state employees and, and their dependents and many municipal employees and their dependents, we're all getting data sets from the, the carriers, and so the carriers are submitting multiple data sets. Now, after four years, I can probably to tell you that now they're going to be sourcing their data from the APCD starting next year. So the carriers like uh, the e efficiency of having the data come in. We also, because we're centralized and we're experts in healthcare data, we were able to leverage some federal grants and build a state-of-the-art data center because I should tell you that this data is identifiable. Birthday, birth date of birth, social security number, member ID, all of the PHI comes in in order for us to do the right linkages for the end users. So we needed a super secure environment and lots of experts about HIPAA, both from a um, secure, data security uh, perspective as well as a legal perspective. So it's better for the data to come here and rather than go to disparate organizations that may or may not have the infrastructure to be good data stewards. 
The other thing about administrative simplification is the connector. Used it, uh, has been using it for state-based re um, uh, risk adjustment program under the Affordable Care Act. They became our enforcers for the APCD. Because if it's just used for research and analytics, it will be a lowest common denominator on the part of the carriers. When carriers have risk adjustment and start sending checks in because their illness burden looks low under the risk scores, they get a lot better about data submission. So that makes our APCD really robust when you have CFOs writing checks to other, into a risk adjustment pool, 15, 20 million dollars, boy, they start asking people in IT, what about that APCD submission? Again, another benefit to our, our work here in the state. So uh, as Craig talked about big data definition, the APCD is large, tera, terabytes of data and growing. So it has the volume, it has velocity maybe. We collect data on a monthly basis from the carriers, which is more frequent than the other APCDs in the country, which collect either quarterly or annually. But where it fails is variety. It's really 837's enrollment information. It's very standard. There's really no variety in it. However, we can leverage what we know in the APCD to create big data to answer pressing questions, the opioid crisis. And this is work we're doing right now at, at GEO. So we have, in the, in the state, we have the APCD and the hospital discharge files. The, those are controlled by CHIA in blue. But the Department of Public Health has very, very important information. Birth certificate, date, uh, death certificate data, the cancer registry, the prescription drug monitoring program for opioid, uh, for the prescription, uh, opioid prescriptions, uh, the cancer registry, the incarceration records of the Department of Corrections, toxicology reports from the ME's office. These are all valuable data sets. So uh, the legislature gave, um, uh, passed a law last year that authorized the Department of Public Health to create, uh, to actually ask us, Chia, to create a merged data set of all these kinds of data so the Department of Health can understand what's happening, what are the forces behind the opioid crisis in Massachusetts. So Chia, our data scientists, used the PHI that we had to create a linked data set, stripped off the identifiers, and that data set is being now housed at the, uh, the Commonwealth IT Center in Chelsea to support the D Department of Public Health to do their analysis. They're gonna report out this summer, or they're scheduled to do so, and it'll be the first time that we've seen this kind of data linkage, and I'm very happy to report that we got linkages of in excess of 90 and 95%. Because we had Social Security date of birth, we had the data scientists who understood how to apply fuzzy logic in some places to make the matches very good. So I'm looking forward to hearing what the Department of Public Health is able to produce with this data. There are other big init data initiatives using the Mass APCD as the spine, we call it, the spine because it has all the identifiers. We are linking, uh, researchers from Harvard, Har uh, Department of Public Health and Harvard are linking um, the APCD to the cancer registry uh, more comprehensively than we do in the prior study. They're linking, uh, researchers are linking it to physician databases, including the, uh, the proprietary SDK, I think, which talks about physician characteristics, answering questions. And um, we have others who are linking uh, APCD to uh, environmental factors, such as what um, particulates in the air, et cetera. So we're seeing a lot of big data initiatives using the APCD as a spine. So, uh, so Craig asked me to talk about challenges. Here are a few, just off the top of my head. Uh, the first is HIPAA, obviously. I mean, we have sensitive data. This is an unconsented data set created by the legislature. So, you know, the statutory authority is good, but the first breach we have, I think, will take down not only our APCDs, our APCD, but possibly all the other APCDs in the country. So we're, we're obsessive about HIPAA uh, at the state. But that said, we're able to use the PHI in such a way to enhance the data. We recently uh, worked with RAND to impute age and ethnicity uh, race and ethnicity onto the data in a probabilistic modeling situation. 
So again, we have the algorithms. We can create a master patient identifier, which is de-identified, but, um, but say the race and the ethnicity based on patient surname and their geography on a probabilistic basis, and then strip off the identifiers, right? So we have date of, we don't have date of birth on the file, we have age. We don't have uh, the name or the street address, but we said the probability that he or she is white, um, Hispanic, et cetera, any of these uh, census, uh, US census definitions of race. So if, you're, if you can leverage the data in that way, you can protect the data, but, but also enhance its usability. We have other challenges. Part two um, from SAMHSA, from the substance abuse claims, it's very difficult to get that data, and it's important to understanding behavioral health and, and opioid crisis. We have the Supreme Court decision that came down in March, which basically said self-insured employers do not have to share their data with state APCDs. And I'm, I'm working in a coalition with other states to uh, work with the Department of Labor to uh, have them amend their rules so ERISA plans have to submit to the APCDs. Um, we don't have information about cl clinical information, and we certainly don't have information about patient satisfa satisfaction. So there are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of amazing uses of the data. We have about mm, 80 extracts out with researchers now and market participants, hospitals and health plants who can use the data to promote transparency in the uh, healthcare delivery system. So I'm happy to answer questions at the Q&A, but thanks for your attention. There we go. We'll bring up Jeff for the next presentation. So, uh, great good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff. I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director for the New Hampshire Health Information Organization. Um, and a great speech from Massachusetts. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, New Hampshire is a very uh, interesting state, uh, as many folks. Just real quick, who's from New Hampshire? I saw a couple of folks around here. Um, so, New Hampshire, uh, as you may have seen from some of the data out there, you know, we're in the top 10% of, of health information exchange between hospitals and some of their provider, you know, organizations. Uh, we're in the top 5% for um, electronic uh, prescriptions as well. Uh, we had the first critical access hospital in the country to reach meaningful use, both stage one and stage two. Uh, so there's a lot of technology and, and we have a, a huge uh, health center controlled network that's been wired for, for many, many years. So it's a very uh, you know, unique in terms of technology is enabled really across the state. Um, but health information exchange uh, is new uh, in terms of an overarching blanket across the state. Uh, we are now just in our fourth year of existence uh, as an organization and only uh, two and a half years into our actually implementation and use of technology for health information exchange. So we're a growing organization. Uh, we've got some great role models like Laura and some other folks that you'll hear from uh, later on in the day you know, to look forward to, but we're starting out early. So you know, as I say here, we, we were created by state law. We were one of the last states to get one of the ONC federal grants to create the health information exchange, and one of the outcomes was to create a nonprofit organization to help manage the health information across the state. Uh, with that being said, this law also uh, inhibits what we can do. So unfortunately, with, with, despite all of the great technology and capabilities across the state, uh, the, the New Hampshire HIO, we are prohibited by law from aggregating any data. So essentially, we're, we're helping to facilitate, we do a lot of conversations, we move information around, but we're really just a, a secure method of trans, uh, you know, transport, uh, and we work with our partners uh, right down the hall here, Orion Health is, a, is our primary technical vendor. You know, so with that being said, you know, we, we really do focus on the transport between providers, a huge amount of value both in patient care, care coordination, and, and time, financial savings by moving that data around. But unfortunately, when we talk about big data, we're right now kind of at a loss because we can't store that big data. So we're looking at, you know, how do we connect those different sources? Right now, like many of you, we are focusing on the, the use of direct standards, and I'll use the air quotes to say standard. 
uh, because we see the, the term direct means nine different things to, to, to nine different people, depending on how you use it. But because we're using direct right now, our use cases for NEO itself are fairly limited. We support the transfer of care summaries being sent for meaningful use. Hospitals use us to send their discharge summaries in some cases, lab results to some organization. Uh, and our biggest use case and our largest volume is enjoyment surveillance and electronic lab reporting to the state. Um, and that's been a, actually a really good success. And we have seen some significant cost savings you know, from our organizations and certainly from the state. Um, but as you know, um, direct has a number of, of variations in formatting and, and methods of transmission. Um, and so we find ourselves kind of in this, this quagmire of other networks. Although we are the single statewide network, um, those that are familiar with the term HISP, Health, Health Information Service Provider, that's really in, in essence what we are today. There's 12 others running in New Hampshire. So one of our, our biggest jobs as the, the aggregation point for at least knowledge and information uh, is, is running the provider directory. Again, for us today, our provider directory is really, for those that might be in New Hampshire, a, an Excel spreadsheet uh, that we email around. Uh, but we're moving towards this number of vendors here that help support those in a much more you know, elaborate way. Um, you know, with that being said, we, we do have a really strong forward uh, momentum. We work very closely with the state. There's, there's a lot of initiatives going in the state, uh, Medicaid and, and other areas that are bringing a lot of money, a lot of federal money to the state, that really hope we can help put this, this blanket over New Hampshire in a much more effective way. Um, like all of you that, that kind of work in this space, we are completely hindered, uh, not let alone our, our legislative uh, constraints, but the interoperability issues. So we, we've heard a lot about innovation today, which I think is great, but our innovation is being, you know, uh, is roadblocking uh, by, by, inter, by interoperability, and that's really been our struggle. Trying to get two organizations uh, simply to talk to each other and send data back and forth has, has been our number, number one struggle. Uh, next being connectivity and trust. Uh, we are a member of Direct Trust, and so we sort of have that universal gateway to open us uh, up to other networks, but we find that not every organization is part of that, uh, and sometimes even that, the connectivity, the trust fabric, building, uh, the, you know, just getting the documentation to make those connections happen can be a challenge. Um, and lastly, as, as I'm sure everyone is, is acutely aware of, provider resources, um, you know, sending data between, you know, uh, uh, third-party organizations is last on people's priority list. And given the multitude, we already heard about macro, which is probably the new swear word before me, you know, right after meaningful use, um, is that the, the, the lack of attention to what they have to focus on. They've got nine different ACOs, three different you know, organizations beating on their door looking for data, want to be interoperable. Um, how do they focus on what, what, what we're looking to do? So that, that's our biggest struggle. Um, so we talked a lot about you know, where we're heading with big data, and I think we are new to the space. Uh, but we, we hopefully what we have learned in New Hampshire, we don't, you know, we don't have the intention of building a massive centralized repository. That has worked in some pockets and other, in other areas it's failed miserably. So coming to the table late ha has given us the ability and foresight to see what's worked and what hasn't. So you know, a lot of what Massachusetts talked about is you know, accessing all these multiple databases. That's where we're focused on moving forward. There is the player, uh, all payer claims database. Uh, the, the, the Health and Human Services, it has a number of clinical repositories. We're just now implementing an immunization repository. Uh, the drug monitoring program, there's a lot of pockets of data that are now being you know, stood up in New Hampshire. Our role as the HIO is to sort of gather that information, find out who's, you know, where the data sits and who needs the data, and, and bring that together. Um, we're also looking at, right now, because of some of the legislative uh, constraints, a sort of a, a multi-pronged vendor approach um, to solve a lot of the data needs. What we don't want to see in, in what's happened over the years is pockets of isolation, you know, hospital-centric networks build uh, or innovate in, in, in one direction and the next door neighbor innovates in another direction. What NEO wants to do is be that overarching arbitrator uh, and aggregator of knowledge and information across the state to make sure we're all moving in a similar path. So we're looking at multiple vendors. I, I listed a couple here. We're, we're, we're putting in a patient event notification service uh, to, again, at least understand where are your patients being seen, what are they being seen for, to start to tighten those care coordination circles a little bit better. Um, we are looking at some cross-data uh, sharing capabilities uh, with collective medical technologies that can help support some of those isolations of data and bring them together in a more cohesive way. Um, and then. You know, continuing on the theme of secure communications, bringing in you know things like secure texting, Tiger Text, and Corp Text are the two vendors that are coming into New Hampshire to help at least improve the data. So if you don't have the data, you can quickly get it from your colleagues or counterparts. Uh, you know they have it. Um, and I think 
with, with all the stuff we heard about this morning, that the patient side, we are trying to figure out where do we fit in terms of, of patients. Right now, because we're limited by direct, direct is not a solution for you know, patients. We're not gonna have uh, authentication of uh, patients to, to build these direct access portals and so forth, but how do we build together and aggregate the patient side is kind of where we're going next. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at our, our website you know, when you get a chance, some of the resources there. Um, and with all that being said, um, this is the team. It's a very limited team. Uh, so New Hampshire uh, has not put a lot of funding uh, into this program to start. So we're trying to build consensus, build um, you know, uh, an understanding of the role that NEO and the potential we have to play to sort of continue to expand our, our footprint across the state. Uh, with that said, I thank you for the time and I look forward to questions afterwards.